When I started in school, I didn't realize I'd, I had a learning problem. Dyslexic was something I didn't even know what the word was. I just knew that I didn't test well and I struggled. In junior high, I was put in LD classes, learning disabled, that's what that means. But at the same time, I was smart enough to realize that I wasn't that dumb. There was one thing I could do, which was I could draw and paint and make stuff. And so that was where I got a little self-esteem as a kid. My mom was a fierce kind of woman when it comes to trying to make sure that I was not left behind. And I grew up with a father who was kind of cool. He raced motorcycles. He loved the inner life of what he did as a creator, as a maker of machinery. I think I was 17 or 18 years old, and I knew that I wanted to make pots for a living. I went to see my father who was ailing, and I sat down with him and I said, Dad, what do you think about me going out and trying to make pottery for a living? He says, is, it, is that crazy or what? And he said, son, he said, work is hard and difficult. He said, it's really nice when you love what you do. I think you should do what you love. It was the moment in my life where I felt like I had been given permission. When I moved to the mountains of North Carolina, I had some soft kiln brick and a kick wheel and some hand tools, and that was it. And a little bit of money, not much. And I built my first studio against my landlord's uh, milk barn. The first four or five years of my potting life, my loss rate in my kilns would be sometimes half or three quarters. And as a maker, I've done it out of this sort of simple necessity of figuring out the next thing. What does it take for me to basically make stuff that people would buy so that I could eat, so that I could continue to make stuff? And when it came to help, there are people like Cynthia Bringle. I was hitting my head against the wall with some things and I would go to her and she would generously open up her glaze book and help me get over things. To this day, that woman is my second mother, at least in the craft world. In the middle of my career, something happened that really changed everything for me. I became a single parent. Somehow, some way, I was able to feed my kids and make work and survive. And my kids ate a lot of ramen. It was a difficult time, but also a time that, that opened up something new for me. I met my wife, Marjorie. I met Michael at Penland School of Crafts. He was a divorced dad with three kids in tow, <laughs> making his living as a potter, so he was a real catch. <laughs> She's a creative person as well, and so our ability to share a language about creativity and making made us very close. When we were first married, it was really clear that Michael needed some help with a part of his life as a maker, filling out the forms to go to shows, and how do you get your work presented? And that was kind of a role that I stepped into early on. Marjorie just gave me that chance to go from being a regional kind of artist to provide me this opportunity to really reach further. All of a sudden, I was doing some Smithsonian Craft Show. Out of that came an opportunity for me to be picked up by museums. Being in the White House collection was absolutely amazing. I mean, I was in line with all my heroes. You know, I have six children, and all of them have been creative. And they've had the opportunity to exercise their creativity from a young age. Making and becoming an artist has been my life because it really gave me the chance to be myself. And that sense of self-expression to me has just been a joy in my life. And I think it is for anyone who creates.